Welcome to episode seven of the Bobcast. We are absolutely delighted to have Dr. Gabrielle Fondaro back on. She was last with us in October last year, which feels like a very, very long time ago. Um, and for those of you who are new and don't know who she is, Dr. Gabrielle holds a PhD in human nutrition, foods and exercise, and now works full-time running her own company, Vitamin PhD Nutrition. She is well known in the industry, not just for her expertise in all things gut health, but also for intuitive eating and her comprehensive coaching, which hopefully we will get into um, in this podcast. And joining us, we have Ashley, who is a registered dietitian here in Nairobi. And I think let's just jump right into it. Welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's yeah, so great to have you back on. Everyone loved the episode that you did with us last year. And I mean, it's such a huge topic. I feel we, yeah, it's always like scratching the surface. And so in this episode, I guess we'll just dive a bit deeper into it. Um, dive deeper into our gut microbiomes. Uh, <laughs> but I guess, how, how are you doing? How are things on the other side of the Atlantic? Well, I'm, I'm here still in Arizona and um, unlike October where the weather is really nice and mild, it's about 115 degrees here, which I think is like, I don't know what that would be Celsius, 47, 48 or something. So it's quite hot. Yeah. And, and part of the state is on fire, which is actually very common for this time of year. Um, so things are a little bit warm down here, but um, otherwise no complaints. It's been um, really nice to be able to go out without a mask, being vaccinated now. So I'm really thankful for that. And um, we'll start traveling again soon. So I actually have a little bit of a road trip planned uh, next week. So there'll be like some hiking and, um, you know, enjoying other bajillion degree temperatures and, and um, some cool landscapes. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, no, that, that sounds amazing. Well, it's our winter here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> gets to 13 degrees. 11. 11. Cold. Yeah, cold. Yeah, very cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah. 11 is cold, man. Well, for us, we, we, we have very thin blood. Yeah. But yeah, Ashley, do you want to, to start, kick things off with... <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> so you'll just have to cut me off when my time is up because I could sit here and just totally geek out <laughs> with you and, and talk all things um, microbiome. So, you know, gut health is just becoming such a huge topic and obviously so much research is going into it. Um, so I did uh, listen to the last um, podcast to make sure I didn't have you repeat anything. Um, but I'm really curious, you know, has there been new research since you were last on, or do you kind of want to bring us up to speed again in terms of the benefits of um, having a healthy gut microbiome or what that looks like in terms of prevention and or treating of chronic diseases, um, you know, specifically like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, um, things like that. Um, and then as well as weight management, I'll kind of start right there. So you can just kind of let us know um, kind mm -hmm. of where the science is at with that. And then, you know, for myself um, as a registered dietitian, I want to make sure that I'm giving people the best science base up to date, um, you know, information as well. So that's also why I'm very, very invested in this. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate that. Um, you're very aware of how quickly the field is moving and, um, you know, how much potential misinformation is out there because we have, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I think I mentioned it last time. It's like the wild west, you know, there's so much that's unknown and people really want answers. They really want a solution. And so they tend to maybe fill in the gaps with some extrapolations and things that might have 
um, a, a logical basis or a physiological basis, but really haven't been fleshed out in the literature yet. So what I've been doing recently on Instagram uh, is a series on science versus science fiction, because what we usually find is that the, the misinformation is rooted in fact. So there's a science to it, you know, like the example of the IgG food sensitivity test. Yes, IgG antibodies are a real thing, and we can actually measure those. That's the science, but the fiction is in trying to apply those to say, oh, that means you have a food sensitivity. So that, that is quite common when we're looking into the realm of, the, of gut health and the gut microbiome. And um, one thing that I've been uh, fortunate to, to have been into lately is uh, writing for examine. So I was brought on as a, as a researcher writer um, in the last couple, in last month. And cool. um, yeah. Right. Thank you. So I've been, you know, um, up to date on like the recent, the most recent, uh, you know, uh, control trials and systematic reviews and whatnot. And um, I was, uh, <laughs> and so, I, and I was having a conversation with um, Nick Shaw of RP because I had written a gut health book and we're waiting on some illustrations. And we were kind of talking about the, about the timeline. And he said, you know, if we, if we have to wait about six months, how much do you think might need to be rewritten? You know, or do you think you'll have to make edits? And I said, absolutely. Because <laughs> I'm even th writing things now and, and, and thinking, oh gosh, you know, I really want to change that in, in the book. You know, these little details, little nuances. So um, that's a long way of saying that the field is changing all the time. And it's really exciting. We're seeing uh, improvements in both the affordability and the accuracy of techniques that we're using to analyze who's there in the gut microbiome and then also what they're doing. So the taxonomy and then uh, you know, the, the um, functionality. So some of the recent articles that have been coming out uh, have been focused on trying to differentiate between the effects of exercise versus diet. So we have seen so many studies, mostly observational, looking at um, you know, the correlations between physical activity and microbial diversity, but almost none of them actually control for diet. And in most cases, an athlete's diet will be different from the diet of a person who's sedentary. Mm -hmm. So we really haven't been able to differentiate those effects yet. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was the conclusion of a recent systematic analysis that came out that found that actually only four studies had ad con controlled for diet. And only wow. two of them had actually, I know, yeah, out of, uh, they had 10 in the, in the analysis but only two had controlled for diet, yeah, or four rather. And then only two saw that there was really a physical activity dependent um, uh, differentiation and variability. Hmm. So Very there are still, right. It's like, we still have so many unanswered questions yes. there. Yes. And it, really, it drives home the point that like, we, you know, anytime we're looking at the microbiome, we're looking at a correlation yes. and yes. we're never looking at just the two variables that we're interested in, you know? Mm -hmm. There are so many other factors. Yep. Yes, exactly. Um, and then another interesting area of research is looking at the effects of COVID-19 on the gut microbiome. And okay. right, right. And it's, wow. um, and not even just in during infection, but afterwards as well. Wow. And uh, yeah, so the, the, um, some of the findings are indicating that there are some COVID-19 specific uh, changes to the microbiome. So there are some kind of characteristics that are associated with COVID-19 infection, and they've started to draw associations between certain microbes and disease progression. Now that doesn't mean that the microbes cause it. It, yeah. it could mean that maybe they're part of the immune system defenses, yeah. but yeah. yeah, so we're just seeing these associations and that those changes uh, seem to persist. Uh, so far in, in a very small um, uh, study uh, so far. So we're still waiting on more data about that. Um, and, and that really does, yeah, it, 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 um, it's in agreement with previous literature where we see that there are some disease specific characteristics or signatures. Mm -hmm. So a person with IBS versus IBD and even the subtypes of IBS yeah. have a, a sort of a different group or a different uh, set of relative abundances of these microbes compared to a healthy control. Mm -hmm. 
But again, we have an established causation. We don't know what role those microbes might be playing in disease progression or whether the disease is somehow influencing the microbes themselves. Mm -hmm. So at best, what we have right now are just associations, just that we tend okay. to see these microbes during these disease states, but we don't have a, a clinical application for that yet because we just don't know what role they're playing. And it would be, um, you know, uh, putting the cart before the horse to say, yeah. oh, let's try to eradicate these, these microbes, you know, and, and yeah. uh, that could cure the disease. Because again, we don't know what role we're actually playing. Okay. Very mm -hmm. interesting. So then, you know, as a, you know, registered dietitian, I guess if somebody has, you know, a, a chronic condition, the best thing that I would do then is overall healthy diet, ensure that you're getting a lot of plant-based foods. I, I think you said, you know, 30 plants in a month or something. And I went through my little chart and I was like, yes, I can do that. Um, and, and so I want to kind of get into a little bit of that because, you know, that's a, a big, huge emphasis on the prebiotics. So that fiber mm -hmm. specifically that soluble fiber. So we're able to, you know, get the, the probiotics to grow, survive and thrive. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of, is that what you would recommend? And then I, I know you talked about pro foods with probiotics and so much misinformation about that. And so I want to dig a little bit deeper this time in terms of where the science is is with what fermented foods or probiotic friendly foods actually have the science base to prove that they are increasing your um, gut microbiome, um, you know, variation in, in terms of also the amount that you're having. So I hope that makes sense. Yes, yes, absolutely. Sort of like the practical applications, like what yes. can we actually do? Yeah, yeah, for yes. sure. Um, and it does tie in a little bit too, with sort of like the weight management side of things. When we're Perfect. looking, yeah, so I can kind of segue in. So when we're looking at the um, effects of things that tend to help us with weight management, they also tend to be beneficial for the microbiome. So, think, you know, yes, exactly. Like, you know, fiber intake, um, maybe physical activity, but in any case, it's a good idea to, to partake in that. And, um, you know, nutrient density and, and diversity as well. So overall dietary diversity, especially when we're looking at uh, plant diversity. And plants, it doesn't refer to, to only vegetables, but it's anything that is, uh, you know, plant-based. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, um, plant-based protein sources. Um, yeah, so not quite as much of the oils, or at least I should say that we don't have clear data on the effects of fat type yet. Okay. Aside from sort of the extremes in rodent models that if, you know, if we give a rodent um, a 60% fat diet and most of that is from saturated fats, they're going to have a whole slew of, of you know, cardiometabolic <laughs> health issues. Yeah, yeah. Same thing for a human. Um, but but uh, some studies have shown that there may be some benefit to omega-3 fatty acids and then sort of like modulating uh, in inflammatory pathways uh, in, in the gut in terms of like what kind of like the microbiota are up to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to kind of like keep in your back pocket. And again, I mean, you know, when we're looking at dietary patterns associated with overall health that, you know, reduced morbidity and mortality, we're looking at things like the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet and the MIND diet and what they have in common, lots of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, you know, mm -hmm. lean protein sources. And so it, there's nothing that's really super groundbreaking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we look at some of the effects of dietary fiber specifically, what dietary fiber does is it surpasses our digestive processes. So we don't have the enzymes to break it down. So it goes on to the large intestine where it can be fermented by those microbes. And they are producing um, a combination of gases, short chain fatty acids, and other metabolites. But our focus here is really on the short chain fatty acids because two in particular, uh, butyrate and propionate have been associated with cardiometabolic health and exercise performance respectively. Now there's not as much data on propionate. It's still very new. And we have kind of a little pet microbe that people have been looking at lately um, and, or a group of microbes, I should say, but the data on butyrate is, uh, is, is stronger and more expansive that we've seen that it uh, may assist with insulin sensitivity that it uh, supports the, the proliferation and health of the intestinal cells. They, they can use that as an energy source. 
Um, so it supports sort of our, our layer of immune defense there in terms of the cells and then also the mucus layer that is being produced by some of the specialized cells in the intestine. So butyrate is uh, associated with health uh, benefits, and um, in a smaller body of literature, maybe also with exercise, endurance exercise performance. So that seems to be a really beneficial short chain fatty acid to have around. And there's also some evidence that, that she, these short chain fatty acids can modulate our appetite and, um, and kind of regulate hunger and satiety. Now that's not as compelling in, in human literature. And obviously people don't eat just because they feel physical hunger. So it's not like it's going to be a panacea, uh, yeah. but it, you know, it's more credence to the idea that if we want to support cardiometabolic health, if we want to support our endeavors in weight management and physical activity, then it, it's a good idea to ensure that we're getting a, a variety of dietary fibers, especially those fermentable ones. Uh, because we don't know which microbes like which type yet. And so okay, the recommendation is, yeah, yeah, we wish we knew. Um, but, you know, the issue there is that you will sometimes have two microbes that may both prefer uh, one substrate, and there's going to be some competition there. And so when two microbes occupy the same niche, mm -hmm. then you're going to have one that's going to thrive and maybe out survive the other. And that doesn't mean that, you know, and we could interpret that in two ways. Oh, this microbe doesn't like this nutrient. And so it's died off or they both want it. And one group was able to, um, you know, kind of uh, overtake the other one and use more of that resource. So again, it gets the kind of the complexity and our difficulty, you know, yeah, and establishing causality because are the microbiome is influenced by our genetics, our immune system, our diet, probably our physical activity and the other microbes. So, you know, how do we control for all those variables? Yes, absolutely. So um, kind of just now, um, so thank you. That was very helpful. So again, very plant-based, having variety is key. All the different fibers is also key. So not just focusing on one. Um, I think that that's very important, you know, because people always ask me, so what's the healthiest fruit, Ashley? What's the healthiest vegetable? And it's like, no, eat the variety, you know? Um, yeah. So I think that that's really important to, to make sure we get that message across. But now mm -hmm. in terms of specific, you know, fermentable foods or probiotic rich foods, can you give us, if there was a list, what are those? I think last time you said the only evidence was on um, the fermented dairy, that there was mm -hmm. actually science to back that up. But talk to us a bit more, you know, with kombucha or kimchi or, you know, cheese, for example, somebody would look at that and say, well, you use bacteria to make cheese. So am mm -hmm. I not getting bacteria as I'm eating that, you know, so kind of walk us through that as well. Oh yeah, sure. So the, the literature um, on, on fermented foods has not changed appreciably since then. And the reason that dairy is considered the only probiotic food at the moment is that it meets the World Health Organization's criteria for being probiotic. So that means it contains live organisms that when ingested confer a benefit to the host. Mm -hmm. So fermented foods do contain live microorganisms Mm -hmm. But the key here is whether or not those microorganisms have been shown to confer a benefit to the host. And then also whether we have enough evidence on the particular food that ingesting that food with those microorganisms confers a benefit to the host. And okay. that's where that's where the data just is not supportive uh, for other fermented foods like sauerkraut, kimchi, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what else, like anything else. Kombucha. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what's interesting too, is that in some cases, because these foods are eaten like traditionally with alcohol, that mm -hmm. there are some fermented um, vegetables, like fermented cabbages that are actually associated with like very, I shouldn't say like, weakly associated with like, gastric cancer. And it's not that they necessarily cause gastric cancer. It's that they're traditionally. What else eaten are you doing? But yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's like the alcohol, you know? Yes. Um, so it's those fermented foods, but also uh, against the backdrop of the rest of our diet, you know? So there's okay. no food in isolation that's going to like, like improve health if we don't have the backdrop of an overall supportive dietary pattern and lifestyle. Got it. Um, okay. Yeah. 
Okay. So if somebody was to ask, you know, what are those foods I must have in my diet? You know, mm-hmm. we, it's not bad that they're eating fermented foods. It's, it's probably good. It's just mm-hmm. that we don't have the evidence to support that it does in fact impact the gut microbiome in a very positive way as we do have with the fermentable dairy products. Is that correct? Right. Exactly. Yeah. That and way. even if we did see that, um, the foods that we're injecting enriched our fecal sample, say with like microbes that are from that food, we still yeah. wouldn't necessarily know that that's probiotic because is that actually benefiting us in some way, you know, with dairy, we see improvements in lipid panels, uh, pretty consistently. So it, that means that it's improving people's cholesterol levels. And so that's where the, the benefit has been shown multiple times. And we can see that that's a probiotic food. That would be things like kefir and, um, and yogurt that, that people have uh, studied in and, and have been replicated as well. Okay. Um, so sorry. Can you guys hear my child in the background? I am so sorry about that. He's having a bad day. Um, so <laughs> I hope you can hear me. Bad day. <laughs> okay. Um, so kefir and your in yogurt. So um, there's some, there's some studies or I, I shouldn't say studies. There's some, you know, um, literature that will say, um, you know, cottage cheese or other cheese or, mm-hmm. um, you know, other dairy products. So is it just the kefir and the yogurt that is, that has that healthy, friendly gut bacteria? Well, that we know um, is positively associated with right. the, the studies. You know, yeah, and I don't know if um, all there it, cottage cheese could vary by like country of origin because I think there are some forms of cottage cheese uh, in other parts of the world that I've heard from from clients that they say I can eat cottage cheese in this part of the world, but like not in in the U.S. So cottage okay. cheese in the U.S. still contains a lot of lactose, and it could be that it's not necessarily fermented. It's like separated in another way, you know, it's like the curds in the way. Um, yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's still really high in lactose, which indicates that it's not really been fermented, you know, because if that were the case, the microbes would have metabolized the sugars. Mm-hmm. And then with cheeses, quite often we don't have live microbes there. So the microbes have already consumed all of the lactose. So, so that's like a, um, you know, life tip for people who are lactose intolerant. You can still eat some cheeses. <laughs> and that's um, what I've had with so many of my clients. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And they're always so happy to hear that. Like, yes, even if you're low FODMAP, you can have some cheeses. Yeah. Um, so, so it does need to, uh, at this point contain live microbes for it to be okay. considered a probiotic. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for, you know, really making that clear because again, there's so much misinformation and, you know, everybody wants to jump on this bandwagon of marketing and Hey, I'm gut friendly and buy me. And, you know, you see that so much, especially in the U S you know, I was in the supermarket industry in the U S before moving here. And so oh, it was just, we saw it and everywhere like chips, chips even <laughs> said gut friendly. We've got friendly yeah. microbiome. I was like, what? No way. This is oh, yeah. so it's crazy. So thank you so much for um, for sharing that. And then um, I wanted to go into immunity. So, you know, there's this connection with, um, you know, gut microbiomes and immunity. And, and of course, the research is still going on. Um, so I'd like you to comment on that. And then also I want to give you a specific example, um, kind of personally, but, um, I'm sure many people can relate to this. So, you know, as we know, like many people live or they're born in one country, right. And then they, they move to another country. So like, for example, for me, so, um, all my entire extended family, you know, lives in the U S since my great, great grandma. Right. So, um, great, great, you know, on whatever side, um, so very, you know, aseptic, you know, lots of use of antibiotics, you know, very clean, you know, all of that kind of stuff, very refined diets, right? All of that, you know, you live it, you see it. Um, and so, of course, it, I think you commented last time that people have, you know, smaller amounts of, of healthy gut bacteria because of that environment and, and other factors as well. So, and then you also mentioned that, you know, our gut microbiome for the most part doesn't change. It remains about 60 to 80%, you know, within reason throughout our life cycle until we get to like our elderly years. And so I was curious, um, you know, so I moved from the U S to Kenya, um, Mm -hmm. and now I'm in the village. My kids are in the dirt. We're picking things off the farm and eating them. And, you know, so I'm deaf, I guarantee I've introduced way more microbiomes into my life. And so I'm just curious, you know, is there a chance or is there any research that would indicate I potentially expanded my gut microbiome outside of that normal range 
because of that. Um, and then I also want to add to that. I've had some personal experience that sort of made me think that it did um, because I would travel to Kenya ever since 2009, almost every year. I swear to God, every single time I would be sick from something I ate and I would be on antibiotics. Like I never travel without my Cipro. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now that I've been living here, I have like, I think I got sick maybe once. And I know it's because I ate something dumb. I knew I shouldn't have ate, you know, eaten it. Like I was expecting it. Right. And it happened, but you know, and then my sister-in-law, she flew in from the U S we went to a, a nice restaurant. I ate everything and she was sick the next day. And I was totally fine. And I was always the one getting sick prior. So just Mm -hmm. curious if you could comment on that. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a really interesting one. And it's a question I've gotten in different forms, like over the years, because I've spoken, you know, to different countries. And um, I I really loved one question that I got. um, I think it might have been when I was in Australia, uh, because I was talking about kind of the regional specificity of core microbiome than that, you know, a healthy person. Um, yeah, and Kenya will look different from a healthy person in the U.S. versus China and Korea. And the person said, well, who has the healthiest? And I was like, that's such a great, you know, such a great question. We really don't know because these, all, these people are all, you know, free of disease. And there's even a theory uh, emerging uh, from sort of the research world that, you know, perhaps dysbiosis, which is sort of the word, that, kind of like a bad word. People think it's, you know, this is a bad thing. It means disease. Really, it just means different compared to the control group or it could be different compared to the healthy group, but one person's dysbiosis could actually be the healthiest form of their microbiome given their disease state. You know, it's an ecosystem, it adapts, right? Yes. So, yes. Um, yeah, so so they are, so when we think about sort of the, the differences in, in who's there and what they're doing, and you mentioned, you know, that it's relatively stable. So we do have this sort of core human specific microbiome. And so we're starting to see that even, um, you know, when people have a disease that they will maintain this core. So they still have a lot of similarities with just other human beings who happen to be the same gender and live in the same region and are within sort of the same age range. So that seems to be pretty consistent. And even the functionality stays consistent because there's a lot of redundancy. So even if we lose a group of microbes, there's another group that can step in and take over the functions of that initial um, group that, that we lost. So it's it's not a static thing that we want to stay the same all the time. It's a dynamic ecosystem. And, and thank goodness, because they have, you know, many, many more genes than we do, like tens of times more in terms of magnitude. You know, we've already like, yeah, we like we, we sequence the human genome. It's fine. It's you know, we've got that all on lock. Like gut, the gut microbiome, like that genome, we have like there. We're not even close to it. I mean, the Human wow. Microbiome Project is working on it, but they have like hundreds or thousands of terabytes of data because there are so many genes. It's pretty, wow. yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, so when we're thinking about, you know, what changes might occur when we travel, for example, or when we live in a new place, we are actually always introducing microbes from the food that we eat. Even if we're in the same place, you go to the, you know, the grocery store, you get an apple, how many other people have touched that apple? Even if you rinse it, there's still going to be some microbes. And actually in the plants that we're eating, there are microbes in the plants. There are microbes in the, the stems of the plants in the, in the leafy greens that we're eating. So we're introducing microbes all the time. And uh, we probably are introducing sort of the same types of microbes locally, you know, within our region, but then we go to a new place and we are exposed to microbes that we may not have seen before. And it could be that we get it on the airplane, um, could be that maybe the airplane food wasn't, you know, stored at the, at the proper temperature. Um, and then, you know, we could have some a foodborne illness from that or just, you know, upon arrival or because we've come into contact with another person, like airplanes are really one of the best places that you could possibly hope to get infected with something uh, unusual, (laughs) you know, just because it's like tight quarters and people are, you know, sneezing and coughing and going to the bathroom and and who knows what. Um, So, so yeah, so it's very common that people get traveler's diarrhea and it sort of like could be from the food or, or whatever else, some sort of like, um, you know, community acquired infectious diarrhea. 
And then in other parts of the world, there are uh, differences in, you know, water sanitation in which microbes might still be existing in the water and the soil as well. And so you mm -hmm. certainly would be exposed to a different set of microbes or many different sets of microbes. And your native community uh, could interact with them in a number of different ways. They could say, okay, this is a potential pathogen and it's expressing virulence factors. And then your immune system says, we have to fight this off. Or it could be just a microbe that passes through and, and it's not in its native territory. It doesn't really try to set up shop. It goes in one end and out the other, you would never know. Or it's something that could thrive there. And then yeah, potentially could um, outcompete other microbes that, that were native to you. And so you could see those fluctuations. And we really do see that, you know, with a dietary change, for example, we can see a, a large magnitude of change in a few different groups of microbes, but the still the whole thing, like the big picture zoomed out snapshot, still still very stable. So what we okay. usually see, yeah, we're, we're seeing like overall stable, but there are certain groups that we can reproducibly change because they're really finicky. Like I've kind of have like personalities for them. I'm like, you know, bifidobacteria, that like that genus is just like super um, uh, finicky. They, they just need carbohydrates and like they're divas, you know, and they'll just peace out if you're not giving them what they need. And then bacteroides on the other hand, they're really adaptive. They're like the, the grizzled veterans of the wilderness. And they're like, I'll eat whatever you give me. It's fine. Um, so, so what we're, you know, the, the other thing that can influence how we might react to something is just, you know, our native um, set of, of microbes, the things that we grew up with, you know, they're going to influence um, whether things can set up shop or not. And then we also have our own just sort of um, anatomical de immune defenses in terms of that intestinal barrier. So we have that single layer of intestinal cells covered by either one or two layers of mucus. And right beneath that, we have the supporting layer of connective tissue that is uh, really rife with immune cells that are constantly sampling the, uh, in the, the contents of the gut and then communicating with one another to indicate whether there's a pathogen present or whether it's something that's recognized and whether we might need to actually mount an immune defense or not. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, so just to kind of conclude, it sounds like my gut microbiome is still basically the same, but maybe I introduced a few new ones that maybe stayed or maybe left. Um, so that's kind of basically how you would summarize that then. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we don't really know what's going on. It's like purely okay. conjecture. Maybe absolutely nothing happened and you just got some foodborne illnesses and then your immune system was like, you know, clear that out. And now we're like prepared for the next time. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, and then I think um, I have one more question and then I can share with um, my friends here. <laughs> um, so my, my next question is you're hearing, we're hearing so much about um, the brain gut connection, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I'm, I'm very intrigued by that. Um, you know, many people struggle with, you know, mental, mental health, um, you know, concerns. And then, you know, many times they, um, they present as GI issues, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, I had a client, for example, who, you know, she had all of her tests done and she didn't have IBS. She didn't have any of these things, but she still would have stomach reactions to anxiety, you know, like throwing up or not able to eat things like this. And so I'm just really curious, where is the evidence in terms of the, the gut, um, you know, brain connection, um, and, and, kind of if you could comment on that. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have um, a pretty sound understanding of the anatomy of sort of the gut brain axis and the nervous system that is unique to the gut itself. So the gut brain axis is primarily connected via the vagus nerve, which is putting out about three quarters of our parasympathetic nervous system tone. So that controls the rest and digest processes. And then on the other hand, we have the sympathetic nervous system, which shunts blood away from the intestines. That's our fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And so when we're looking at the gut brain axis, we are taking that into consideration. And also the intestines have what's called the enteric nervous system. So they are regulated by this sort of independent nervous system that doesn't really need input from the brain, from the central nervous system. So those are regulating a lot of the 
um, sort of uh, reflexive muscle contractions that occur as food is moving through the GI tract. But they're all still communicating with, uh, with each other, uh, if not directly via neuronal pathways, then indirectly via the peripheral pathways. So we're looking at like neurotransmitters and peptides that might be um, sending signals, you know, binding to receptors on the gut uh, or binding to receptors in the brain. Now, one of the big misconceptions uh, is around serotonin. So we have a gut-derived serotonin and we have a... Yeah. Yes. Same <laughs> comments. Yes. Yeah. So, and then we have a pool of serotonin that's in the brain. So serotonin, once it's actually produced uh, in the gut, is active in the periphery. So it regulates gut motility and it also regulates which substrates we might use while we're fasting. But it itself can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So the pool of serotonin that's in the brain is produced via a slightly different biochemical pathway. So there's a different rate limiting enzyme that regulates that. And right now the stance is that these are two discrete pools. So our gut derived serotonin is not really having an impact on our mood. That being said, the microbes can produce precursors that might be able to cross the blood brain barrier. We don't have anything conclusive yet to say, you know, in humans, we found that we can modify brain serotonin via the gut microbiome. That's not the case. And I wish that that would, I kind of wish that that would go away because I think it really, really oversimplifies, um, yeah. you know, human mental health. It's kind of like, yes. absolutely. Uh, you know? like, thank you so much for just like telling us there's like those two different, you know, serotonins and it can't impact, it can't cross the blood brain barrier. I think that's huge. And like you said, I think that's a huge, huge misconception that people have. So thank you yeah, so much sure. for making that so clear. Um, but again, you know, definitely maybe something that the gut microbiomes are producing may be a substrate mm -hmm. that then can cross the gut, you know, the brain blood barrier and potentially help with mental health. Is, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, there's some emerging evidence now. We've got more in rodents that there's a link between the gut microbiome and, and brain development and behavior. And mm -hmm. we're starting to see some literature in, in humans that's of higher quality. Now, mm -hmm. what the, the issue in, in past studies, especially looking at um, autism spectrum disorder, is that there mm -hmm. often is lacking a control group. So they might, you know, give people, uh, you know, in, in the case of autism spectrum disorder, it was a fecal microbiome transplant. And then over the course of two years, there's an improvement. Well, we didn't have a control group. And how do we, you know, how do we differentiate between the effect of time versus the effect of, of the fecal transplant? Uh, or things like, um, you know, eating uh, like a, a yogurt beverage, you know, they might have um, subjective ratings of stress after that. And people feel subjectively less stressed. Um, you know, after having the yogurts, but again, you know, there could be a, a placebo effect and, um, you know, we have to be very careful when we're trying to extrapolate data from rodents because a, do mice have moods? I don't know. Maybe some people think they do. Uh, and B, they're never, they're never intended to, to model the human yes. cognitive experience. You know, it's, it's purely mechanistic. It's just like, could this possibly happen? And then Maybe because we can see, you know, there's a, um, a signaling pathway or, or, you know, we found that there's enough of a similarity in the anatomy and physiology that it's plausible in humans. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of, you know, finding um, like interventions that actually affect mm -hmm. cognition or mood, the mm -hmm. quality of data is just very low because, yeah, again, we're not seeing like quality controls. We're not seeing, you know, that the mm -hmm. studies are being blinded and things like that. And so- they just do it right so we can get all the evidence from the study. <laughs> I guess because it's harder to publish if you uh, if you come up with negative results if you find oh, that like there's no difference. <laughs> of course, right? Uh, um, so on that on that topic, then is there any evidence that mental health medications are? negatively impacting the gut microbiome. I know before you did talk about some other medications, you know, metformin, I think was one of them. And I can't mm -hmm. recall the other one. Um, so any mental health medications that they found in negatively impact the gut microbiome? Well, actually the gut microbiome probably plays a role in the efficacy of a lot of these sort of psychoactive drugs. Uh, because they're metabolizing them. And so uh, when we when we take a drug, it could be metabolized in the gut. It's going to be, you know, there's going to be a metabolism in the liver. Uh, and we didn't really know until recent years that the gut microbiome was actually playing a role in drug metabolism. 
So mm -hmm. examples would be like um, second, um, uh, uh, where are they? Um, think like drugs for like schizophrenia mm -hmm. um, and um, L-DOPA for Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. So we actually rely on their metabolism of these drugs. And that could also influence, uh, you know, the inter-individual variability of drug efficacy. Like sometimes mm -hmm. people do really well with the drug and other times it's not very effective for them. Very interesting. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. Um, but there hasn't been necessarily like, you know, Lexapro, for example, the negatively impacts the gut microbiome. You haven't found a specific drug that negatively um, impacts it like metformin, for example. Right. Well, it would be hard to say that it like negatively affects the microbiome itself even mm -hmm. with something like metformin, that there's an interaction there and we probably okay. rely on the microbes for, again, for metformin's efficacy. And that being said, there could be some deleterious effects uh, associated with the GI distress that people experience via metformin. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Right, um, but, you know, but maybe not, but maybe the, the metabolic improvements that people experience with, met, with metformin would have an indirectly positive effect on the microbiome. You know, like that's just yes. a completely unanswered question. Um, yes. So, so, you know, and then there are some drugs that are associated with like changes in appetite that lead to maybe like weight gain or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I maybe dietary differences. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, it, it could be like an indirect sort of like downstream effect. So anytime mm -hmm. we're looking at something that's going to change the way a person thinks and behaves and eats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that could potentially influence the gut microbiome for better or worse. Mm -hmm. But the only drugs that are really going to have what we could say to be like a negative effect acutely mm -hmm. would be mm -hmm. something like antibiotics because yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, they're going to be knocking out like swallows of them. microbes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, in terms of, you know, the psychoactive drugs, it's really just a matter of noticing that, oh, okay, they play a role in metabolism we don't know whether that is, you know, quote unquote, like harmful for those microbes or not. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very in I could keep asking you questions. So I'm going to let my friends join in because I'm looking at the clock and I took almost all the time. So oh, <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, don't worry. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think there's a great question. Really. Yeah. I, I, it, it's absolutely fascinating. And mm -hmm. just how, how it's changing so fast and new info coming and all of that. Um, but Jess, do you have other questions on the microbiome or we can move to intuitive eating? Andy, how's your- No, not in terms of for me. Um, you know, it is a fascinating topic, but there is a lot of, I do like the myths around fermented foods. The yeah. fact where you even see people trying to claim beer is a, a probiotic, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah, and the Bucha community has grown here in Nairobi, so ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a good episode for them. Oh, I don't think oh, yeah. it's very so popular. Yeah, because uh, kombucha is it's, it's big everywhere. Now. It's big. Yeah. It's like the new new craze uh, all over Nairobi. It's a new coconut oil. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Oh. I think it hit us probably like two, maybe two years ago is when like kombucha was just huge here. And then I, I think people- So many brands. Yes, oh yeah, yeah. And then people started to realize like, you know, I mean, it tastes pretty good if like, if you're into the taste, but then, um, you know, the thing is with, with kombucha, it can actually, you know, be, I mean, for one thing it's fermented, for another thing it's, it's um, carbonated. So it's like effervescent, you know? And if you drink a lot of it, it can really cause some bloating, some gas, maybe a little bit of diarrhea. And people were like pounding kombucha and being like, I don't feel awesome, you know? And so I think it kind of has like, it extinguished itself. Yeah, because, oh well, yeah, it's yeah. kombucha and apple cider vinegar now. It's oh yes, apple cider vinegar. You know, that's it's a big- for everything. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is. 2000 cures, did you know? Yes, yeah, it's like a panacea and it keeps, it kind of like dies out and then it like reemerges. Yes. And right now I've seen it in um, sort of like the functional medicine realm as being a, a, a oh. treatment for, for low stomach acid. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, maybe like either if you have an understanding of like how pH works and how yeah. digestion works, then it's very clear that like apple cider vinegar is not a replacement for stomach no. acid. Stomach um, acid has got such a low number of pH. is like the yeah. 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 <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, 
you know, it's logarithmic. So it's like if apple cider vinegar is a two and a half a pH of two and a half, and then stomach acid is a pH of, you know, one and a half. It's not, that's not a small difference. It's a tenfold change, Huge. you know? Um, so yeah, so, so that's been a little bit frustrating to see that reemerge. And then, you know, people kind of misunderstand digestion and think like, it's just that we're dissolving things. We just need any sort of acid and just put the food in there and, uh, and it'll dissolve when that's really not how it works. So, and um, by the way, I'll get ulcers from doing that. So <laughs> like, yes. Yeah, so and like you're this, your esophagus is not going to be okay with that. <laughs> yeah, your teeth. Wow. Yeah. Oh, a tooth enamel. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah I very I'm much enjoyed that like, on, on your Instagram, how you you've gone through, I think, glutamine and, yeah. and the apple cider vinegar. The glutamine is interesting because, I mean, there's a small community here of like bodybuilders and everything. Yeah. And I mean, those supplements are really touted. Like the, the glutamine is, is it's, it's up there. Um, what else is up there? Yeah. In terms of supplements. Yeah, yeah for sort of gut health. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sort of, uh, what do you want to call it? Bone broth is still. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Bone broth and collagen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Powdered collagen. Got to work. Ingesting yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> collagen's definitely going to work to improve your skin. <laughs> Yeah. Right. It just goes right into the intestinal lining. Nothing happens to it. It's just, it just sinks right in there. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's like that. I, yeah, I've, I've tried to um, kind of parse out, you know, where does this come from, you know, with something like collagen uh, or bone broth, I think it's that people, uh, you know, have an awareness that collagen is present in, in the intestinal wall. And that, um, you know, there are some cell culture studies that have used specific types of collagen on intestinal cells and found that it upregulated tight junction protein production. And from there, the extrapolation is because collagen is present in the intestinal lining and because the cell culture study showed it, then we should probably eat the collagen and then it'll heal the intestinal barrier as if there's something wrong with it to begin with. And so that's kind of like, that's parsing out, okay, here's the science of it. And then like the science fiction, which is most of it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that saying a little bit of knowledge is dangerous mm. you know, they, they latch onto one part of study or the literature and run with it just because it's, it's profitable right yeah yeah and it like it's uh it sounds scientific you know that was kind of the thing with l-carnitine way back in the day and fat loss because oh l-carnitine we need carnitine to transport the fatty acids into the mitochondria where they're broken down via beta oxidation so obviously take carnitine and then it ramps up the fat burning process. And then like that actually doesn't happen. Yeah. It's, it's, I know people who drink yeah. monster energy drinks because the white one has L-carnitine in and they think it's actually making them healthier. Yeah. They are drinking so like the taste of it. There's a bit of caffeine. But the fact is you're definitely not getting the L-carnitine out of that monster. Yeah. Right. Because my first yeah. prep, that's the first thing um, I was advised by the like older bodybuilders. Yeah. They're like, you must. Yeah. So I got one and I was like, yeah, it must be working. I'm, I'm getting lean. Uh, it's not the cardio, it's not the diet. It, it, uh, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's just sad how people use, well, science fiction to market products and, you know, make a quick buck before. I guess research comes out and it's like, well, it's wrong, but then it, in a way it's too late because like the apple cider keeps coming and going and it's yeah. like people believe it for a minute then they're like, nah, let me, let, let me try it again. Let me see if it works. So. But they realize it tastes awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's being coconut oil. I hate coconut oil, but, but still, you know, you know, you know, people again, cleaning their mouths with it. But you yeah. know, with, uh, with fat loss, everyone likes to suffer. So it, if it tastes bad, it must be. It's worth it. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, yeah, they can't, it can't be like a simple thing. You know, it's gotta be like, oh, if I don't feel like I'm dieting and everything sucks and I'm punishing myself, clearly it won't work. Exactly. Well, I think that leads us. We've still got a little bit of oh, yeah. time left. If we can yeah. just touch briefly on intuitive eating because again i think that is coming here and it is mm -hmm. coming a bit of a buzzword here and without people really understanding 
what it means. Um, so it'd be great if you could just, yeah, tell us a bit more about what it means and sort of, I mean, how do you go about coaching it and who, who do you normally find that it works for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I love that you, your, I love your segue because it is such a great point that I think part of the pushback against the idea of intuitive eating, um, and it has a couple different definitions, uh, but part of the pushback comes from that sort of culture of dieting, the culture of suffering for an outcome, right? And people think if you're not suffering, if you're not exerting your self-control and your self-discipline and your motivation, is some sort of moral failing and you have a weakness of character. <laughs> and so when they're presented with the idea of maybe some people don't want to count their calories or don't want to pursue fat loss. Yes. And they're like, well, you know, what's wrong with those people? They're just lazy. They just don't care. They just, you know, they deserve whatever shame is coming to them. And tough love is like the new, you know, tilapia to thin your skin. Oh, tough love. You know, that's what you need to get motivated. So, um, and, and I think it's, you know, we just see this, like when we have one message, then we're going to get the counter to that message. So, you know, as people are talking more about self-compassion, then we have a lot of people who are going to say like, no, shame is effective and it's not, but you know, they just have that bias and it's very hard for them to acknowledge the possibility that we can be kind to ourselves and encourage and motivate ourselves from a place of caring. So when we're looking at intuitive eating, it's used in two different ways. Many people are using it colloquially to mean eating without tracking macros, but that's not really the same thing as the original intuitive eating developed by Tripoli and Resch, which is a self-care framework that's intended to break the cycle of chronic dieting. And it is intended to help people rehabilitate their relationship with food and exercise and their bodies so that their decisions about what they want to eat and how they want to move are coming from a place of more um, intention and care for themselves and kindness and a place of acceptance and appreciation for their bodies right now, rather than following external rules about what foods are off limits or what foods have to be eaten uh, or striving for striving to meet a thin ideal, a specific ideal or engaging in exercise as a way to earn or burn calories. And it is aligned with Hayes, which is health at every size. So health is at every size is a trademarked name and it refers to both an organization and a social justice movement that centered around uh, challenging weight bias and weight stigma, about respectful care uh, from practitioners, about uh, removing the morality from foods and bodies, and about encouraging people to eat and move in ways that support their well being and that they enjoy. Now, the social justice aspect of, of Hayes sometimes can be just as extreme as the opposite side of things where people are like, everyone's got to count their macros, and there's, you know, and there's like weight stigma and fat phobia. Anytime we have an extreme, we're going to have a conflation of data. And so you might see things like, um, 95% of diets fail or, you know, labeling certain things as, as fat phobic or um, implying that there are no risks to a high level of adiposity and that's all from weight stigma. And the evidence really doesn't support that. Nor does the evidence support that shame or stigmatizing people is effective for motivation. And on the contrary, when we shame people, we actually are promoting, uh, you know, the development of, of eating pathology. So we really, I think, can avoid either one of those extremes and instead look at the, the real root of the organization's um, guidelines and values and look at the root of intuitive eating and realize that what we're looking at really are a, a set of, of universally applicable skills that can help us navigate what is a very tempting uh, and, and um, uh, abundant food environment. So we can help people move from a place of restriction and excess oscillations. You know, this food is off limits. I can't be around it because every time I'm around it, I, eat, I overeat it. Well, the way that we break that cycle is not through continued restriction. 
it's through habituation to that food. It's through helping the person establish a different internal framework so that when they're around that food, they can discern whether they're hungry for the food, how much they want to eat of the food, and whether they might want to just wait because they can eat it at any time later on. And so what I try to coach is not just intuitive eating because I want to be respectful to that framework and that there are intuitive eating trained practitioners who guide people specifically through that framework. And because I operate in the middle where I can guide people toward intentional weight loss, I coach for internally regulated eating. When a person wants to move away from tracking, educate them about what intuitive eating is. And if they want to go that route, they totally can. Uh, I am very transparent, you know, I'm not an intuitive eating practitioner, but I understand the way that it is intended to be pursued, which is very individual. There's not like a set of rules around it. And when I coach for internally regulated eating, I uh, help people kind of train their, the, their, uh, their awareness, their interoceptive awareness in the same way that we, we do with training, like in the gym, we, we, we're familiar with RPE and RIR. Like how many reps in reserve do you have? What's your rate of perceived exertion? How else do we know that? But getting in touch with our bodies and figuring out how they feel, you know, is RPE nine, my soul's about to leave my body. We can do the same thing with food. It just takes usually more practice because quite often people are really disengaged from their hunger and their wholeness signals. So it does take more thoughtfulness and it does take more practice. And so there's a practical application also for things like macros and calories. Sometimes people are like, I don't want to have to think about every meal. It's actually really helpful for me to just have an indication of like, what's the number of calories and then, you know, have that meal and it's prepped and you don't have to use your brain for it. But we don't necessarily have to throw out the baby with the bathwater and say only macros or only internally regulated eating. We can say, hey, here's a set of macros or calories. In addition to this, if sometimes you feel like you're not hungry and you want to practice internally regulated eating, you might say, hmm, I'm not really hungry for this whole meal. I'm going to eat a little bit of it, see how I feel, and I can come back to it in a little while. So I try to, to not, you know, I'm, I'm not an absolute in any direction. I, and I um, try to adhere to what, what we call in, in comprehensive coaching, nutritional agnosticism and trying to be anti-dogmatic. So, you know, if a person wants to pursue weight focused versus weight neutral, if they want to do keto, if they want to be vegan, you know, even if someone is really interested in the carnivore diet, my role is not to tell them what to do or not. My role is to ensure that they're fully educated about whatever it is they want to do so they can make an informed choice. And if they want to do something that I feel is way outside the purview of my ethics uh, as a coach, then I can just say, hey, I really want you to meet your goal, but I'm not the coach for you on that. Like I wouldn't be comfortable coaching someone long-term on a carnivore diet. I would just say, you know, the evidence is not strong enough for me to feel comfortable doing that. Um, I wish you the best, you know, let me know if I can help you find someone. And I think that is like our responsibility as coaches. We don't have to be everyone's coach, but it really is beneficial for us to not be dogmatic about the approach that we're taking either. You know, like you set yourself standards and principles, but like, you know, once we say, oh, I'm a keto coach or I'm only a macros coach. Okay. But maybe you can help more people if you expanded, you know, your, your lexicon too. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I, I think it's it's good to just be yeah, ha have an open mind about it but you know know when to stick to your lane and that's how I work with Ashley a lot I know more about calories and macros I'm not so good at I don't know how to teach someone how to eat intuitively whereas Ashley you're great at doing that so um it it's yeah I wish more coaches would work together on it or or just be like yeah I'm not I don't really understand that but you know I'm completely open to it and you know, one way works for someone. Macros are great. I love them. They work for me, but for some people, but that's just the, the, the pits. And yeah. you will never work. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's about, I think, you know, helping people determine what works for them and like what things for them are tools versus obligation. Because macros, like you said, they can be a tool for some and they can be a cage for others. Yeah. And so, you know, that's part of, that's really part of, of the intuitive eating movement is to help people break out of that, that sense of kind of fear and obligation and commitment to this one thing that's ruling them. Mm -hmm. And some, and, and there are some practitioners who would say like, no one should ever count 
calories. No one should ever count macros. And I'm just of the opinion that um, while they're pursuing a rehabilitation of their food relationship, uh, you know, if it's someone who's in a, like a treatment for anorexia nervosa, they might need, you know, a, a medically supervised mechanical eating plan that does include um, someone else's awareness of, of calories and macros. Like that needs to be counted. But for a person who just feels like they're stuck in a chronic cycle of dieting, it can really uh, hamper the, the process if they're still trying to count and if they're still using those external guidelines and external regulators for their intake, because they are not giving themselves the chance to push their boundaries a little bit and establish comfort without those. And then I've had people who come back, you know, years later and they've said, actually, I'm kind of curious to know what I've been eating lately because I'm really tired and, you know, I got my gallbladder out and I want to kind of know how many grams of fat are in the meals. Yeah. Okay. If that's a tool for you, that's awesome. And then you now have that awareness of where you've been and you can identify those red flags. So how, are, how is it feeling for me right now to count these macros? Feels fine. Or, uh, you know, I'm feeling really stressed out. I feel like I really have to meet these. So it's not, again, about like making someone do a certain thing. It's about like, can I help you get to a place where you know what tools work for you and you know what tools don't work for you? And then you have that self-efficacy. You have that independence. And we stop working together on the day that you tell me like, I think I'm ready. Like, I'm going to go work independently. And I'm like, awesome. You know, and I love it when people want to work with me long term, but I love it just as much when people are like, after several months, they say, I'm in such a different place right now. I want to go do this by myself. And then I'm just like, I'm here if you want to have a chat. Mm -hmm. And that means you did your job so well. When they feel that confident and that empowered, I think that's huge. And I think that says so much about you as a practitioner. Um, so I think all this conversation has just been so well said. And we, I just think you're an amazing professional. I just, oh, have to say so much. Oh, wow. <laughs> I just love it. I just, it's so good. We need more of this. Um, yeah, really good. And I, I do, I do love your comprehensive coaching, Gabrielle. I'd love to, yeah, get more into that. But I know you've got other things to be doing today because your day is just starting. We're, yeah. <laughs> we're ready to roll into bed, but you're yeah. <laughs> you're gonna go. But we really, really appreciate you coming on and talking to us. And yeah, that was absolutely fascinating and yeah great to have you as well Ashley I'm pointing in the wrong direction <laughs> wherever you are on anyone's screen um I think she's frozen but yeah Gabrielle thank you so so much and we will of course link all your yes. information so that everyone can find you um and yeah learn more about um yeah what you do Awesome. Thanks again so much. It's awesome to talk to you. And um, even though Ashley's frozen, it was awesome to meet her. Well, oh, she disappeared, but um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it was great to be here. And thank you again. And um, hope to talk to you guys again soon. Oh, yeah, thank you well, so we would much. love that. Yeah. We would love that. <laughs> Always. All, right. All right. Take care. Have a great right. day. Bye -bye. Bye. Yeah.